Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm delighted to um, host this uh, 40th iteration of our Argent Talk series. Today we are welcoming David Elliott, British art historian, curator, writer, and teacher, who is now based in Oxford. And he's going to talk about art and trousers, tradition and modernity in contemporary age and art, which coming from his uh, the monograph that's recently uh, published. Uh, let me introduce um, David. Uh, during his uh, 20 years as a director of the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, uh, from 1976 to 96, he presented contemporary art from India, Japan, China, and elsewhere in Asia, taking a leading role in curating pioneering exhibitions prior to the multicultural shift at art museums from 1990s onward. His unconventional approach of uh, interpreting art in tandem with political, social, cultural developments outside the West is evident throughout his uh, subsequent uh, stints as a museum director in Stockholm, and importantly, as the founding director of Mori Art Museum in Tokyo and uh, Istanbul, and the curating of international biennales from Kiev to Sydney. It is also testament to the existence of the multiple modernism as opposed to the non-Western being merely a peripheral to the West. Um, exploring the connection between trousers and the masculine characteristics of a modern modernization, Westernization, and colonialization, war and conquest, art and trousers brings together uh, David Elliott's perspectives on the contemporary art he has encountered across the vast and incredibly diverse continent, including the art of Central Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, the Ottoman Empire, Pakistan and, and Philippines, Russia, Thailand, Tibet, Turkey and Ukraine. So um, let me uh, welcome David. Uh, David, thank you for joining, and the floor thank is you. yours. Thank you very much indeed. And a very nice introduction. Good morning and good afternoon, evening to you all, and thank you for attending. Yes, I'm going to talk about well, a short history of the trouser, uh, the theme of cutting across cultures in a precarious world, and this, of course, is related to this book, Art and Trousers. Tradition and Modernity in Contemporary Asian Art. It's so many different things. I mean, so many different ideas. And that idea is, is here in the, in the cover that you're looking at, which is, which is a mashup of three different images which appear in the book. I mean, the first is a, is a photograph taken by Yoshitomo Nara uh, in a pet cemetery somewhere. We don't know where. And uh, it's of uh, these uh, someone's grave of presumably their, their, their cats. And they would chosen to have these models, these stone models of Bye Bye Kitty on them. Well, that's the head. The body is taken from a Cultural Revolution era poster from China, and it shows Mao and his adoring workers around him. And then the legs is taken from a, a um, photo montage made in 1932 by a Japanese uh, student at the Bauhaus in Dessau in Germany. And it shows the stormtroopers walking into the Bauhaus in Dessau and shutting it. So the Nazis closing down this major haven of modernity. There's no other document that actually relates to this. And the only one document was made by this Japanese student, artist, very good photographer, who was there and not recorded it. He, he took the photographs and then made this photo montage after. So that gives you a bit of the spirit of uh, what I'm doing. And um, uh, just to talk about the, what the book is about. I mean, it's about so many different things. It's about storytelling. And in a way, history is about storytelling. People often say that histories is written a story of victors. And very often this is true. And certainly we have to take this into account when looking at other people's histories. So the book isn't way about historiography, the history of histories. It's about viewpoints, it's about many different people's viewpoints, particularly artists. But it's also about my own viewpoint and my own personal history as I learned to 
see these things from afar um, and to discover what I was missing and what I felt so many other people in the West were missing. Uh, art history, and the discipline in which I was uh, trained, is about comparison and it's about quality. I always ask myself, is, is this any good? Why should I waste, why should I spend my time um, looking at this? And as soon as you start comparison work of, works of a single artist, you compare them with works by other artists. And I found that I had to do this with what I was experiencing in the art world in the West, which when I was growing up in the 1970s, becoming a, a young curator, it was nearly all about Western Europe and North America. And everything else was peripheral to that. And it was also art made mainly by men. So it was, it was not, not only geographically and ethnically limited, it was also gender limited. And, and this seemed to be so ridiculous. Why was it such a small pool we're looking at? And so I started to look further there and compare things which I knew uh, from, say, British art history with, say, what was going on in Japan or India. And, and I, I realized we're just missing so much. And, and we had a completely skewed view of the world. Talking about skewed views of the world, how about patriarchy, gender and power? Power, of course, is the worst thing for skewing people's minds because those who have it hold on to it desperately. And those who haven't, I mean, either just give up and accept it as being normal or they struggle against that. And patriarchy, of course, is still with us. I'm afraid it's still rather toxic and uh, we have not got complete equality between sexes, nor have we got complete equality between the different peoples of the world. Now, trousers um, are symbols of barbarism in some cases, as you see, but also of civilization. They're also symbols in other contexts of, of colonialism. And in the context of that, they can be about barba uh, bar brutality. But they also may be, in their sense of being related to civilization, be about decency. Now, I was talking about Eurocentricity. Well, the trousers do at certain times re represent Eurocentricity and other forms of prejudice. I mean, the traditional trousers in, in Japan, for instance, were the hakama, um, which are rather sort of very billowy, hardly trousers. And um, when uh, Westerners first saw these for the first time, they thought they were very, very strange, normalizing the Western suit. They're about practicality and pragmatism. Um, trousers make sense if you're in a cold climate. And um, also the ways in which trousers move across the world at different times in history do in uh, indicate the ways in which culture as a whole is transmitted. And lastly, and most importantly, this book is about art as fact and knowledge. And through that, beauty. So, let's get stuck in. I'll just try to get to... Right, there we go. I have to go back one. So, to start in the midst of history, uh, and with a Japanese artist, well-known Japanese artist, Hiroshi Sugimoto, who is fascinated by time and infinity. And it's one of a later series of, uh, of uh, pictures he did of museum dioramas uh, in the 90s, but he did his first ones in the series in the, in the mid-70s, and it's of Cro-Magnon men. The first people, you can say the earliest trousers, um, and this, uh, these are reimagined by museum technicians, who knows when, perhaps uh, I would think in the 1950s, in a very now museologically old-fashioned way. Yet the way Sugimoto uh, photographs these is that he, he makes them look real. They're no longer in a case behind glass. He makes these look like they could be almost real scenes. And this um, compaction of time and also of Reality with artifice is something that's absolutely fundamental to his work and also many other good artists. Now, in Asia, this Malta Buret culture gives the first real depictions of clothing, of trousers. And uh, I'm just giving you one small example here. Uh, these are from small figurines from Irkutsk province. But you can see these clothings engraved on them. They're out of mammoth ivory, and uh, they're made very near Lake, uh, Lake Baikal. 
These are the oldest surviving trousers, extant trousers. And uh, they're of church end men. Uh, and it's a mummy of a 55-year-old male. Um, and it's uh, in the Taklamakan Desert in West, what is now Western China. Interesting thing about these is that they were made by um, rather tall, blue-eyed people. They were preserved so remarkably by the salt in this desert. Um, and so the clothing is, uh, is still there. Uh, you can see the trousers there. They're related, it seems, to uh, the knitting pattern, re related to Eastern European prototypes. The women also were wearing, um, were wearing dresses. So there was a kind of uh, a gender base in, in that, it seems. Now, round about the same time in the Terracotta Army, the famous Terracotta Army, we're the early third century BCE, before Common Era. Uh, you can see very clearly there, the cavalryman is wearing trousers. Now, this cavalryman, in, in social terms in China, just didn't count, really, as a person. He was very important as a soldier. But people, real people of any status, wouldn't dream of wearing anything like that. Um, he's wearing them because they're convenient when you're riding a horse. Again, around about the same time, uh, and a little bit further west in Asia, uh, these Scythian warriors, they were famous for their wearing of trousers. And uh, you can see them depicted here in this gold comb. It's a tiny, tiny work of art. And uh, uh, Scythians uh, were characterized by Greeks. This is probably made by a Greek goldsmith. But Scythians were the enemies of the Greeks. You can see they're fighting here somewhere in Central Asia, Western Central Asia, uh, together. And um, Aristophanes and Euripides, the two famous Greek playwrights, they uh, refer to Scythians and their trousers with great mirth. They regarded them as ridiculous figures, so othering them for, for their primitiveness. But they weren't so primitive because they commissioned things, great works of art like this. Another Greek image of, uh, of trousers and a Scythian. And the other important uh, wearers of trousers at this time, of the, these, um, these barbarians, were the Amazons. Now some say this was a mythical group, a matriarchal group of women warriors who, who went from one side of Asia, in Eastern Asia, through to the West. Um, and they're, they're sort of famous for, for wearing trousers. Um, and no one's quite pinned down who they were. They certainly appear in, uh, in, in Greek art quite, quite a lot. And here, uh, they've been colonized by the Greeks because this uh, work, this after a lost original by Phidias, which is from fourth century before, before Common Era, you can see she's wearing Greek garb and she would never have done that. Um, but interesting thing is that the Amazons almost certainly were a matriarchal culture and a nomadic matri matriarchal culture. And in Kazakhstan and other parts of Eastern uh, Central Asia, there have been found graves of uh, warrior women, uh, which were uh, obviously, uh, there were cultures which were run by women, or at least women on an equal level with men. Now, trousers still continued to be a source of hilarity amongst the Chinese and uh, uh, the, the waves of, um, of migration that took place continued into the common era. Here's a Northern Way uh, guardians from a tomb. You can see they're wearing trousers there. They look rather crude. Um, this is now, we're thinking, fourth century common era. Whoops. Well, I have to go. And um, the ways uh, quickly became signified. They quickly became like the Chinese. And so there's a, a distance of, of, of maybe um, 150 years between these two works where they're depicting themselves as these crude figures uh, who just come over, off from the steppe. They've just settled. And after they'd been settled for say 150 years, 200 years, they're making art like this, influenced very much by Indian art. Of course, it's Buddhism, which is traveling into China, uh, across uh, uh, from west to east into China. 
and also Gandhara school, but one can also see an influence from, from maybe the Han dynasty as well in this, in this dragon you can see there. Now to move to a consideration of trousers in a, in a slightly different way. And uh, really the idea that women have uh, rights and this was not really put forward. I mean, we don't know what happened in these matriarchal societies. One assumes that women did have rights in those. Um, but generally, they were very much secondary. And one of the critical figures, I mean, Mary Wollstonecroft is the person who was quoted in, in, in Britain at this time, at the end of the 18th century. But Alain de Gouges, um, who uh, in, in a riposte, uh, to Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette's Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789, which we say kind of kicked off the French Revolution. A couple of years later, she writes a Declaration on the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. Because, of course, the Rights of Man had nothing, to, nothing for women really in it. Um, so she's a critical figure. And unfortunately, she was guillotined in the Great Terror. Now, Charles has become very politicized in this time, because the great terror is run by these people called sans culotte, which means without, not without trousers, without breeches. And trousers, which were called pantalons, were worn by workers. And in fact, the workers in China, ever since the mists of history, both male and female, had also worn trousers, pantalons. But they didn't count. In the sense, this clothing didn't exist because it wasn't in polite society. It, it, it denoted lack of status rather than status. So that is why the, uh, <coughs> the revolutionaries in the, in the crowd call themselves sans culotte. It's what they haven't got. We're without breeches rather than that we wear pantalons just as a matter of every day. Now, also in relation to the French Revolution and the British fear of what had happened in France, uh, it was clear that fashion really had to change. And this character called Beau Brummel, who was a friend of the Prince Regent, who was in power as, as George III, King George III, slowly went mad and then took over after that. He invented a new kind of dress, these, these trousers. Um, now, this kind of dress had been worn by the military, had been worn by sailors, again, people who didn't really matter. And he made it an item of high fashion. And uh, it became the dandy, the figure of the dandy became absolutely critical in, uh, in uh, Western society at this time. You can see it gets picked up very quickly. Whoops. There we go. And just jumping forward 30 years to uh, Charles Baudelaire, um, this great French poet, writer, artistic figure, flaneur, the person who uh, experiences urban life in a new way. He's absolutely dressed in, in this dandyish style. But it also went much further. It's a painting of Sultan Mohammed uh, Mahmoud uh, II from the 1850s, just about the same time as that of uh, Charles Baudelaire, you can see he's wearing trousers. <coughs> and in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire at this time, some kind of modernity, some kind of modern art was being in introduced, but it was not being introduced by the people. It was being introduced top down by the Sultan and really bringing this into culture. And uh, it was almost certainly a Western artist who, who made this painting. And women also began to adopt trousers. Um, uh, this is Georges Sand, very famous and prolific writer and a romantic writer period. And she decided not uh, uh, out of any sense that she wanted to become a man, but she wanted to do what men did. And if she wore male dress, she could go places and do things that men could do. So she'd go smoking, she'd go into the clubs and all this thing. She would just tough it out. Now to just jump a little bit sideways and uh, to look at images of women uh, in Japan. And in Edo period Japan, um, which is one of the, Edo was one of the biggest cities in the world at the end of the 18th century, over a million people. And it was virtually a kind of barrack house. Uh, the, 
the daimyo and all their troops, their retainers went there where they were put together. Uh, there were no wars to fight, but they all had to practice martial arts and uh, the, the shogun could keep an eye on them that they were doing nothing wrong. And so they had to create some entertainment and that was the, the ukiyo-e, the, the, the floating world, which was a matter of pleasure, evanescent pleasure. Much uh, hated in Buddhism, of course, uh, much denigrated by Buddhism as being uh, illusory, but uh, we, ha we had to do something, I guess. So uh, brothels, bathhouses, the kabuki theater, bars, uh, in a way, uh, a very strong identity of Edo was created at this time, and, a, and a, an economy of pictures. So this is by tomorrow, it's of a courtesan, of a, of a, of a basically very high level prostitute. Now this is Yoshitoshi about 100 years later, looking back to that same time, and uh, it's a very different kind of woman we're seeing, rather than this elegant uh, geisha figure of uh, Utamaro. Uh, it's a woman of the, of the Keisai era, uh, calling looking itchy, the appearance of a kept woman, not a courtesan, a kept woman in the Keisai. So this is a woman with a, <coughs> a degree of agency of her own. She's feeling itchy, not the customer. It's a fascinating change, and it's a part of the, 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 the kind of the tapestry of pictures of women within the 19th century, which uh, show distinct changes. In China, uh, in, uh, in theater, uh, men, like in Japan, often played female roles. But one of the leading roles was that of Hua Mulan, uh, a, a legendary woman who in the Northern Wei Dynasty, going back to the fourth century common era, uh, took over, seeing her father had been enlisted to fight, she said, no, 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 I'll go and fight in your place. So she fought and everyone thought she was a man and she became this great hero. Now she's part of the Disney empire. But this is Mei Lan Fang, uh, a man playing her role in the 20s. But uh, this idea of the woman uh, warrior is very important also in Japan, the Anabu Geisha. Uh, and here's a real example of one Takeko Nakano, uh, who actually fought in the Boshin Wars and, 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 and died in that. It's wonderful and very moving photograph of her just before uh, she finally perishes, uh, fighting for the shogunate against the new Meiji Emperor. And this fascination with strong women, with women warriors, I mean, continues, and it continues actually in actuality. Because the Satsuma Rebellion of 1877 against the uh, Meiji Restoration um, over towards Kumamoto, uh, there was a, a, a women's uh, brigade uh, that was fighting against the new Meiji army. You can see there they're strongly trousered up, wearing German uh, quasi-Prussian uniforms. So in the... Uh, Second part of the uh, 19th century in Japan, and particularly in, in <coughs> what would become Tokyo after 1868, no longer Edo, the whole economy began to change and women, uh, in it industrialized, became more modernized. The old Edo continued in some way, but slightly shrunken and um, women were working in factories and the women's mo movement started. And, uh, this uh, figure of Amaratsu, uh, the, the kind of founding goddess of, of Japan, the goddess of the sun, um, becomes a very critical figure in this. In the beginning was the sun. This was the title by Raicho Hiratsuka of the first edition of a, of a feminist magazine called Saito. Um, and that's uh, Raicho Amaratsu. It came out in, in 1911. Saito means blue stocking, uh, and that is very much referring to 18th century British feminists uh, in, its, uh, in its reference. But uh, she's an interesting figure, the journalist, act anarchist, activist, and feminist. Um, the magazine was closed in, in, in 1916 in the middle of World War I, um, and uh, she becomes a more peripheral figure uh, later, uh, rather eccentric and interested in eugenics, um, 
And then uh, after World War II, she becomes a very strong member of the, um, of the peace movement. But there were other women in Asia at this time uh, who uh, felt they had to adopt the George Sant approach and, and, and dress as men so they could behave like men. This is Chu Jin. Uh, she was a female Chinese revolutionary. She was brought up in a middle-class family, uh, had her feet bound for a while. She had several children. She just couldn't stand it, and she sold all her jewelry, uh, went to Tokyo, which was the most advanced place to go to in Asia in the uh, second half of the 19th century. And she joined the Tongmenhui, the underground resistance movement against the Chinese Qing dynasty, which was formed there by Sun Yat-sen. And she was a very active member there. <coughs> but at that time, while she was in, in Tokyo, this is, this is shot while she's there, she took up martial arts, and she dressed as a man and went around as a man. And when she went back to China, she had adopted her female role. But sadly, uh, uh, trying to set up um, some uprising there, it failed, that particular uprising. And she was um, betrayed by someone, arrested, refused to uh, alter her views, and she was publicly beheaded in her, in her town of birth. Excuse me, I just have to... <clears throat> well, trousers in China, this is a big subject. I mean, the, the, the Xinhai uh, Revolution of, uh, of 1910, which eventually brought down the Qing dynasty. I mean, here's the first provisional president and the father of the republic, Sun Yat-sen. And uh, there was a whole question about what to wear, because the Qing dynasty was still basically wearing the same old-fashioned tunics, that went back to the Northern Way, I mean, to the civilized Northern Way. Uh, clothing hadn't changed that much. And um, so he wanted something that was modern, but also he didn't want something that was Western. He didn't want to make it look as though they're being colonized by the West. So he said, well, we'll take the, take the, the German, uh, sorry, the Japanese uh, cadet uniform, um, which is what he's done here in this uh, Zhong Shan Zhuang, uh, it's called after him, it's sort of Sun Yat-sen suit. And um, uh, he, he unfortunately didn't realize that the Meiji uh, emperor had adopted this cadet uniform in the 1880s from the Prussian example. So it's by one remove, it's a kind of German suit. But it gets picked up later by Mao, uh, same tunic top with the four pockets. Uh, and. Uh, um, then became a symbol of, um, of revolutionary activity in the, in the West, as a number of uh, radicals wore it uh, to show their alliance in the 1970s. But trousers um, in the Islamic world, I mean, they seem to have existed, kept going um, in, within Central Asia and uh, the Islamic world, uh, right through history for both sexes. Well, they have the shawarma and the kameez. And uh, uh, so it would be quite common for uh, Islamic women to wear uh, leg coverings in this form. This painting, famous painting by Eugène Delacroix of uh, the femme, the women of Algiers, it's suggesting a harem, of course. And um, in 1834, just uh, four years after the French had occupied Algiers. Um, so it's very much uh, has a polit strong political context as well. But also this feeling of, of, of luxury and voluptuousness of the exotic East. It's strongly exoticist. But it plays in another way, because in, in North America, there was a strong <coughs> emancipation movement for women even in the 1840s and 1850s. And the leading figure of this was Amelia Bloomer. And uh, she was made much fun of in the American press. And they said, well, the emancipation dress that you want women to wear, which is sort of male, but with these sort of baggy trousers, they look like Turkish gear and um, a Turkish primitive Turkish fashions. And they called these, uh, satirically, they called these kinds of trousers for women, bloomers. And it still exists in the, in the English language as really what is basically old women's underwear. But within Turkey itself, um, uh, and by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, 
<coughs> the harem is, still exists, but the, uh, the first wife in the harem is wearing Western dress, and she's reading Goethe. It's an interesting painting in, uh, from a number of points of view, because it actually shows this very pensive woman uh, who is the first wife, the Circassian first wife of the, of the Sultan, in the last years of the Sultanate, before it was uh, taken over, uh, pondering, thinking, reflecting, and she's been reading Goethe. And within just four years, five years, um, they were replaced. The, the Sultan uh, abdicated and uh, Kemal Ataturk took over the, over the country. And he decided he would completely reform the way the language was written and also the way that people dressed. Before that, people were wearing feathers, they were wearing baggy trousers, they were wearing uh, religious gear. He said, no, nope, we all, we all modernize. We all modernize and you all have to write in Roman script, uh, no longer in Arabic script. Or, um, and uh, at, a, at a stroke, <clears throat> people, those who could read, and it wasn't probably that many, uh, were immediately divorced from their heritage. Uh, unless they wrote, learned to read both, both forms of script, the, the old Arabic and, uh, and the new Roman. But the exotic ideas lived on. I mean, uh, in France, they very sorry to let them go and wouldn't. Uh, and this is from 1911, and it's a fashion uh, by Pierre Poiret, leading fashion designer, inspired very much by Sergei uh, Diaghilev's um, uh, ballet Russe and, and uh, Rimsky-Korsakov's ballet uh, opera um, Sherazada, uh, the Steel Sultan, which was <coughs> high fashion for a while in the West. <coughs> Excuse me. Looking the other way, uh, in Germany, um, artists were looking, uh, as they had from uh, the latter half of the 19th century towards Japan as a source of exoticism as well. This is by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner and it's of his, of his uh, girlfriend Erna with a Japanese umbrella. And he also echoes, echoes a painting he made eight or nine years earlier um, of, a, of a, a young girl also with a Japanese umbrella. So it's evoking not only Japan but you can see in the screen behind um, some sort of more primitive African uh, ideas as well. So an, an, an otherness, an exotic otherness. Well, there was an interest in, in, in otherness too on the Japanese side. And before the, uh, um, before the First World War broke out, uh, in which uh, Japan was on the Allies' side, um, a number of uh, young Japanese people had visited Berlin and uh, had become very fascinated by the art that was being made there. In particular, uh, Kosaku Yamada, who was a musicologist, and uh, Kazuo Saito. And they made friends with Hevat Walden, who was the uh, publisher and head of the Sturm uh, Gallery and magazine. And this was really the, the, the powerhouse uh, for the, uh, uh, the avant-garde in Berlin and Germany at large at this time. And they decided, well, we want to show this in, um, in Tokyo. So Walden said, well, you can have 150 prints, and uh, you showed them. And sure enough, the exhibition actually took place in March 1914 in uh, the Hibiya Gallery in Tokyo. had a huge impact on young artists, and it got caught there by the, by the First World War. Excuse me. Whoops. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I hope you can hear me. Um, now, there's a young artist, one of these young artists who was very impressed is Tetsugoro Yoruzo. And in this key work from 1912, I mean, even before, while, uh, while the others were still in Berlin, getting to know Herbert Walden, he made this self-portrait with red eyes very, very much influenced by German Expressionism. We don't quite know how, I mean, Cubism too, but um, don't know quite how. But there's a strange uh, inscription that he made on the back, 
It's a self-portrait. And he's written in Roman script, Selbstbildnis. That's German for self-portrait. He did many self-portraits at this time, but this one I think is particularly evocative. And it shows really how quickly and strangely ideas and influences were moving. Another direction <coughs> was from Russia. And uh, I'm talking now at the end of the uh, First World War, when Japan had been fairly cut off by the, by the effects of it. <coughs> and um, Russian artists start to visit uh, uh, Japan and, and make an impact there. So uh, David Ber Berliuk, the one on the left, uh, came to Russia in 1920. And uh, he organized with uh, Viktor Palmov, who came over with him, the first exhibition of Soviet Russian art, the first Japanese exhibition of Russian painting in Tokyo, it was called. And this had a huge infl influence on, the, on, again, the artists in Tokyo. They'd been aware of, um, of Italian futurism before, but certainly not of Russian futurism. There's no way they could have had access to it in that the borders were closed through the war. And um, this also uh, impacted uh, on a group of young artists who, as soon as they could get to Germany, did so. Now, the war ends in 19... 1918, uh, and then there's a period of violence on the streets and revolution for a year, 18 months. And um, it really takes uh, till 1921 before one begins to see German artists coming back to Berlin. But in the interim, the Dada movement, which is very much an effect of the artist response to the First World War by German artists, made a strong impact. And this work by Hannah Hirsch, certainly was widely circulated. And this young artist, Tomu Wadachi, who came to uh, Berlin, I think at the end of two, uh, 20, no, 1921, or the very beginning of 20, 1922, uh, initially to study expressionist literature, but also he, he stayed on and worked with other uh, young Japanese artists there. Now, in this self-portrait, he's showing a very interesting picture of himself. He's wearing a fez, as if he were a uh, pre-Atatürk um, Turkish person. He's wearing a Russian peasant blouse. And the style of the painting is very much reflecting um, a Russian artist called David Sterenberg, uh, who was shown in, um, in Berlin in uh, 19, 1921. So either he uh, uh, saw something that had been left behind out, or he actually saw this exhibition. And it's a, it's a kind of fascinatingly uh, hybridized work. Also with him at this time is Tomoyoshi Moriyama. Uh, this is a painting he certainly started while in Berlin. And uh, it's called Sadistic Space. You can see some Hebrew script that he put here. And, reflecting a very sophisticated uh, understanding about, about futurism. And then an artist who didn't go to Berlin, Masamu Yanase, Dada Photomontage, The Length of the Capitalist Drool, very much in the spirit of Hannah Hirsch, uh, and also his drawings were very much in the spirit of George Gross, another German artist, very much showing the, the corruption and the kind of terrible social conditions there in Germany after the end of World War I. Moriyama goes back to Japan, forms a group called Mavo, and uh, here he's, he's uh, showing in, uh, he's in travesty, uh, in women's clothing at the top there, uh, a performance called Dance of Death, which is a, uh, adapted from part of Frank Wedekind's play, uh, Teufel, Death and the Devil. Uh, which was written before the First World War. But taking European culture, uh, advanced avant-garde culture, and really making something new of it was very important here. And also within film, one can see this new expressiveness breaking through. A page of madness, 
um, by uh, Tensuke Kinugasa, a film. And uh, there's a, it's a woman uh, dancer doing this, Eiko Minami, uh, and uh, she's still alive. It's incredible, uh, strange, eccentric dance, which at some point plays into, uh, much later, into, into the formation of Buto. I told you at the very beginning about um, uh, Iwao Yamawaki, this, uh, this work at the end of the Dessau Bauhaus showing the stormtroopers marching in. He was uh, in, the, in the photography department there, but uh, with his wife Michiko, she was in the, in the weaving department. Uh, and German influences coming into Japan were, were very strong, but there seems to be an affinity certainly between Tokyo and Berlin, and this was the subject of an exhibition we did some time ago at the Mori Art Museum, and I've extended and uh, reprinted the, the writing I did in connection with this in the book. And uh, we're looking here at a work by Kikuji uh, Ishimoto and Bunzo Yamaguchi, and uh, it's a late 20s, one of the new Bauhaus-style department stores, the style of it is rather much like Eric Mendelssohn's work of this time rather than Bauhaus, but that doesn't matter. But both these young architects had been involved at the beginning of the, um, at the, beginning of the, uh, of the 20s in a group called the Bunriha Kenchikukai, um, which is the artist succession group, Bunriha Kenchikukai. And... Um, they were looking at uh, imaginary architecture based on organic forms and remarkable projects that they were making. And these relate very much to what German architects, particularly in Berlin, were doing at the same time in the aftermath of the First World War. Again, these fantastic organic forms. No one quite knows how, how this, what this relationship was. But certainly one of the critical figures in, on the German side was Bruno Taut. Uh, there's a work from 1914, The Glass Pavilion. He was developing this idea of crystal architecture, kind of mystical idea, which he then extended into alpine architecture. So taking the crystal into the ice and the mountains. And Taut became a really important figure in, for Japanese culture. Before that, he'd become the city architect in Berlin in the mid-20s, and uh, many of his housing projects still exist. In fact, one of my friends lives in them. And uh, then he uh, felt that he, he should go and uh, help people in Russia. And uh, he went and worked in, in Moscow, I think, for two and a half, three years, uh, advising uh, the Moscow City Council on workers' housing. He got completely frustrated by this and realized they weren't really acting in a, in a very rational way and came back to Germany. Unfortunately, the day he came back, the day before he came back, the Nazis had just been voted into power. And uh, he was told in no uncertain terms, uh, as he did have communist uh, and affiliations, that if he didn't get out, he'd get into trouble. And so he, through this gentleman, who he knew through the International Association of Architects, through uh, Isaburo Ueno, he was invited to come to Japan. He came the long way around overland through across Russia, and he arrived in uh, 1933. And uh, he was, became fascinated by Japanese culture while he was living there. Uh, he found it very difficult to get work. He made a lot of crafts work while he was there, which was sold in some shops. And he got one major um, architectural commission, which was a private uh, villa in Atami called the Huga Villa. And uh, he really only did the interiors of this. And you can get an idea from this image, you know, the quality of what he was doing. And it was not purely following Japanese uh, traditions, but actually using and understanding Japanese traditions and going further. But um, he, uh, he um, became fascinated by the, um, by the imperial architecture, the, the Kasuga Villa in, uh, in Kyoto, uh, and then published a number of books on traditional Japanese architecture. 
uh, which were, came out in German and in English. So it became a very important conduit. But it started to get difficult for him in Japan, also in that Japan's relationship with, them, with Germany, with Nazi Germany, was becoming increasingly strong. And so he had to go to, to, to Turkey. And he became a professor in the, in the art academy in Istanbul. And the kind of saddest thing is that he, his, his Japanese pagoda was actually built on the banks of the Bosphorus in Istanbul. The buildings he wasn't able to build wanted to but couldn't build in Japan. He eventually built here. He, uh, he lasted two years. Uh, he was working on the Ataturk's mausoleum. Ataturk had just died. He found himself working next to Joseph Torak, a fellow German but a, uh, a absolutely confirmed Nazi and a famous portraitist of Hitler himself. It must have been a terrible time for him anyway. Time overtook him and he passed away. Now to return to, to images of women, um, how are we doing? Uh, actually, I'm going to move forward just one. Uh, images of women, the, in the 1930s, uh, the new idea of the modern girl and the modern boy really swept across the world. And in, 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 in Japan, the moga and mobo became the kind of neologism that described this, as you can see. Trousers are no uh, mystery to them. Uh, and then it was rather damped down by a return to traditional values under the military dictatorship in the 1930s. You get a sense of this in the this image of, uh, of a tea room, the kind of uniform of these young women here. And a return to Confucian values, really values which have been held dear by the shogunate so many centuries ago, uh, returned in the 1930s, the idea that a woman's duty was to be uh, a good mother and a, a loyal wife, Bosei, uh, I think is the, is the concept. And uh, whereas in, uh, in Hollywood, uh, trousers still continue to be worn here in Martha Dietrich. She's wearing them, it becomes a craze in the West. And then it continues right up almost to the present in 1970, when trousers start to be no longer purely gender specific. Uh, this image of David uh, Bowie from 1971, showing a famous rock star in a dress, and Mick Jagger had done the same thing, uh, also designed by Michael Fish in the previous war. And also closer up to time, uh, Yoji Yamamoto, his interest in, in British street style brought us back to trousers. Uh, so going from uh, west to east and east to west again in his uh, winter collection 2003-2004, the Paris, Paris Fashion Show. So madness, um, the prop group Madness and modeling these for one of their famous songs called Baggy Trousers. Now to change uh, away from the, the history of trousers and really to come on to uh, more the uh, story about how people discover things, which I raised in the beginning. I'd like to uh, just run through a couple of exhibitions I did while I was in Oxford very quickly. And really in 1982, uh, having the opportunity to visit and work in India, to visit artists and to do something, a series of exhibitions in line with the Festival of India. And uh, this work was the first one, the first exhibition called Gods of the Byways, and it was really a folk art. But I thought it made sense only to do this if we also did the contemporary art, the modern art. And so we did an exhibition on very focused area of uh, folk art, but then a history looking at the development of art in India since independence from the British at the end of the 1940s. So this is the catalogue image for that, K.G. Subramanian. It's, a, it's a quoting folk art in its work, but it's in reference to this terracotta panel is to the atrocities of the war in Bangladesh that had just taken place when this was made. Francis Newton Sousa, one of the early Bombay progressive groups. And M.F. Hussein, also from Bombay at this time. 
he'd been a photographer, a, a, a painter of posters outside cinemas. And uh, he adapted his style very, very radically. Uh, in this, it's a wonderful painting of, I think, of 1951 called Man, um, looking at the new, the figures, the personalities of the new republic, the spirit of the new republic. Nalini Malani, an artist still very much present, uh, often working in video, but shown here in a woman in a pink room. She, this time, was very much interested in psychoanalysis in her work and the, the, the figure of the woman in an introspection. And a wonderful artist, now sadly passed away, Murnanini Mukherjee. It's, because uh, you can see, it's over two meters high and these woven hemp structures, which are female, they're domineering, dominating, they're fascinating, uh, they're completely uh, uh, enveloping in their imagery. With uh, the trouser, there's also an element of, of masquerade, parody. And uh, the whole aspect of the Commedia dell'arte, I think, is important in that it's not just purely a Western phenomenon, which uh, happened uh, in, the, in the 16th century, starting in, in Italy. It's actually part of a tradition that stretches across the world, um, uh, right across Asia, and uh, also even across the Americas, within different cultures. So Pantalone is uh, one of the stock characters of the Commedia Arte, the man uh, characterized by his pantaloons, his, his male dress, but also a figure of ridicule who pretends to be young but is old and that he's actually returning to childhood in the way his voice shrieks and pipes the older he gets. That's Shakespeare, I'm paraphrasing, describing this character. The idea of the world turned upside down. I mean, it's one of the, uh, the basis of satire, of parody. Uh, here's an example from the English Civil War, uh, that things are not what they should be. Things are, have been completely reversed or turned on their head. We saw images from the French Revolution. Here's from the Russian Revolution, a factory of the eccentric actor. And it's a still from the Adventures of Octiabrina, this female superhero of uh, October Revolution. Um, and uh, it's uh, quoting partly Charlie Chaplin, eccentric dancing, music hall. And they made a, even a, a, a manifesto, the eccentric manifesto, where they said they would found salvation in the trousers of the eccentric. It's a bit better than Stalinism. But the, this idea of, uh, of the Commedia dell'arte, one can see cropping up in the strangest of places, this Piero figure, well, the, one of the stock characters, this love lost hero. Here in Victor and uh, Yelena Vorobiev's uh, uh, photograph, it's one of a big series called Kazakhstan, Blue Period. They're quoting here, of course, Picasso's Blue Period, but in a rather more um, satirical way in that the blue, blue period is of the sadness of Kazakhstan, of a, of a place which is not as good as it should be, perhaps. Or Chachai Pupi is better than ever, a Thai artist, uh, really looking at his identity, uh, it is him, uh, looking between his legs in a disrespectful way. But is it disrespect or is it submissiveness? It's, we're never quite so better than ever, God, sardonic. Um, Thailand was supposedly never colonized, um, although it was very close to be colon being colonized during World War II. And the various myths around it, about the hospitality of its people, the, the Siamese smile. Um, and Cha Chai works very closely with these ideas. He also works with Western ideas of exoticism. And uh, there's two paintings from a series called Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going To? In, what, in which he's, he's um, uh, quoting a famous painting by Gauguin made 
about the, when he was out in the South Seas, of uh, uh, the, the, the fate of the individual, which he showed in an exotic way. And uh, here he's, uh, Chacha is showing uh, much, much later, the fate of the individual as he sees it completely dismembered, almost caught in a, in a wasteland and completely alienated uh, in, a, in a way that uh, makes sense in contemporary Thailand. Or Makoto Aida. Uh, this is his Wayno Pantaloon diary, uh, back to Pantalone. Uh, and uh, it's a performance he made uh, where he's uh, um, showing the, as if he's a kind of holy fool, an idiot, uh, unable to control himself. Uh, in fact, wetting himself in front of a public audience in Wayno Park. He describes himself as HD. Um, uh, ADHD, uh, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So uh, he certainly has a slightly strange aspect to his character, although I think he makes some absolutely incredible works. Well, this work, The World Turned Upside Down, um, and also a certain amount of trouserlessness in Shigeo Ishii's Pleasure. It's made in the part of a violence series, 1957. So made in Tokyo after World War II, uh, time of very strong American influence and really of a society that has become so modernized and has so lost itself. It's a, it's a painting of pleasure, which seems to me to be full of pain. Well, this painting, shaped painting, as you can see by Onkowara uh, from one of his early works made, made while still in Japan, it's just called Black Soldier. And it would have been a common sight during the occupation. Um, American GI. And it's a strange view looking up a tunnel from the boots. And the boots, the sole of the boot is the thing that presses down most on you. That's the Katanaka. Also at the same time, the most active female member of the Gutai group, not the only female member but her, her uh, electric dress. And really a view of an exhibition made in Oxford in um, 1985 uh, called Reconstructions Avant-Garde Art in Japan uh, from 1945 to 1965. And this is one of the exhibitions which I was talking about earlier, which being able to research and get to know this, this work actually showed how much we didn't know about art in the world. We're only looking at our own little goldfish bowl. This seemed to me to be so, well, ill-advised and a little bit boring. There's so many things. You can see the Kusama work very close, the chair. And we followed that up with an exhibition of, of, of Kusama's, more of Kusama's work, a one-person show in, in 1989 in Oxford. And I really like to talk about um, Another exhibition which happened much, much later called Bye Bye Kitty, which uh, took place in the, uh, in the Japan Society Galleries in, in, um, in, in New York in 2011. And uh, this was really looking at, uh, at Japanese art from a particular perspective. I was asked to do this. Um, to show what was happening now and what seemed to me to be the most important thing happening now, particularly from a Western perspective, was so many people were obsessed by the idea of kawaii, of cuteness, that this was a, this, that Japan was obsessed with it. Well, in a way, yes, but in many other ways, not. Certainly a lot of serious artists were not at all obsessed with cuteness. And um, so in a, Four part exhibition. I mean, it was one exhibition, but it had uh, four sec uh, three sections in it. Um, I tried to explode this misconception, I think successfully. And uh, this is from the first part called Critical Memory. And Miwa Yanagi was a very important element of this. this Windswept women, the old girls' troupe. These are pictures of powerful women as if they're like some Tibetan revenging goddess. Um, but they're both young, but also very, very old. 
So the flesh is sagging, but it's also firm. They're very, very strange hybrids um, and very strange images. As you can see, they're four, four meters high. These are very strong, imposing works. And there's an image of women, which is, which is, it's certainly not flattering. And it's certainly very powerful. It makes you think uh, about, about um, image, self-image, and what is present and what is absent. There's an earlier work that she made, the fairy tale series, uh, images, photo photos, uh, setups that she makes uh, from famous uh, fairy tales, which are usually terribly cruel. And this is Little Red Riding Hood. As you can see, Little Red Riding Hood has been eaten by the wolf and she's found her grandmother inside there. So she's hugging her grandmother. It's a great image of sisterhood inside the dead body of the wolf, which she has killed. Another image, strong image of power. Now on the, on the male branch of uh, Bye Bye Kitty, uh, there was um, uh, Makoto Aida again. And uh, I wanted to show uh, in this context a work which is strongly based on this famous uh, woodblock print by uh, Hokusai, The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. As you can see, it's a, it's a uh, erotic print in which she, fisherman wife is being pleasured by two octopuses. And this is Ida's version of it, giant member Fuji versus King Ghidorah. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an image of, uh, of sexual violence and quite shocking. But when we start to analyze it, w w what is he getting at? I mean, one reference, of course, is otaku culture, game culture. Um, but it, it goes far beyond that. I mean, he's not, he's not glorying in this violence or in this uh, uh, rape. Um, it's the giant member Fuji, Fuji, the symbol of Japan. And Ghidorah, this, uh, this dragon-like figure from, from manga, absolutely rapacious, violent, killing. Saying something about the state of Japan in modern culture and of youth, and of actually dilemmas or uh, uncomfortableness that he himself feels. And this uncomfortableness, he, he associates very much with the commercialized salar salaryman culture, uh, which he regards as really sapping Japan. And this is called the ash-colored mountains. Um, as you can see, it's a kind of Chinese traditional landscape. But when you look closer to it, the landscape is made up of the piled up dead bodies of, 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 of salarymen. And these are not evil in themselves. They're, they're, they're just willing pawns. They've been used, they've been thrown away, just dumped on this heap. They themselves uh, cast no shadow. They have no substance. Also in this section called Critical Memory, uh, Tomoko Yoneda's uh, uh, work uh, based on Kimusa, which was the uh, Japanese military hospital um, that they built in Seoul during the occupation, but then it all became the military, National Military Defense Security Command, and a number of coups were, were, were done there. So it's, it's a very strongly redolent building, and then it was, uh, it was, it was abandoned. And Yoneda was able to take these photographs here and make a series of works. And now it's been incorporated into the National Art Museum in, uh, in Seoul, in Korea. But these sort of contrasting images of, of, of kind of horror and nature. Strange ghosts. And coming into a, a part of the exhibition called Threatened Nature, uh, I like particularly this work by uh, Tomoko Shiyasu, and it's called The Breathing Wall and Blessing Wall. And uh, it's a work as a, as a membrane in the middle of the, of the space. And as people move in the space, the air goes through it because it's been cut in several pieces. There's a close-up. So that it's a living wall and a breathing wall um, that, uh, that makes a very, very strong impact. Orinko Kauchi, 
photographer, uh, a series of works from Isla, which are really about a ritual of birth and death, starting with an egg. Just very, very simple images without captions. An eye. And death. Just more images, of course, than this, but just to give you a, a taste of that. And then moving into the third part of the exhibition, which is called um, Unquiet Dream, Chiharo Shiota, Dialogue with Absence. Her figure as a young woman um, pumped with her blood being pumped around the whole gallery. Well, this image, which you may well be familiar with from uh, the Kanazawa Museum of Contemporary Art, a room of memory. Um, these were windows that she'd taken from skips from demolished buildings in Berlin. And in her imagination, these are, these are buildings that witnessed terrible events in history, within German history, in the 1930s and 40s. And she'd really remade them into a new structure which was a room of memory, a shrine, but also made something positive out of it. And then Tomoko Kashki, uh, a young Kyoto-based painter, um, also looking at, at the body um, and the way how the body operates in space. This is her, it's called Inner Box. She's lying on the floor on a very hot summer's day and just a gentle breeze is blowing through above her. very carefully painted there on chamfered wood panels the way the whole presentation of these is extremely immaculate and also by the same artist a rather more abject image the body not so happy which is cowering in a corner actually perched in a in a urinal and then also in the in the uh, unquiet dream uh, Kumi Machida, who was one of the um, Nihonga artists, uh, who keeps the Nihonga discipline uh, going into the contemporary series. Her images of these strange children, and images of torture or displacement or parental violence, you're never quite sure what's going on, but they're deeply unsettling. And that is the image from Yoshitomo Nara, that you saw at the beginning, which is uh, the uh, the Bye Bye Kitty gravestone. Um, so the whole idea of Bye Bye Kitty was really that no, contemporary Japanese art is extremely serious. Artists are really engaged with their time, with the spirit of their times, and they care. And uh, yeah, so I'm looking at the clock, and I think uh, it's time to come to an end on that note. It's a good note to come to an end on. Um, I could keep going for another two hours, but I'm told I can't. So uh, we'll come over to the discussion now. Uh, thank you, David. Actually, you can, um, because you're still just um, 10 more slides, that then you can finish. So if you'd like to... Oh, yeah, well, we'll see where we get. Okay. Yeah, if, if you can go another 10 minutes ah, or something, absolutely. then you can finish. Well... Now, this is a really worrying image. It's taken by a, uh, an American photographer during the Philippine-American War in 1899. And it's not posed. I mean, I can't imagine this image would be posed. And it's a women, two Philippine women, begging for bread. They want to have an image of colonial influence of trousers. I mean, here it is. But what really upsets me and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here, is this character. This gaze of absolute malevolence and just the sadness of these two women. Well, this was a starting point for me when I was approached to write something about Rodel Tapaya, a very important Philippine artist. And I didn't, at that time, didn't know so much about the Philippines, nor, nor his work. And it was a, such a pleasure and a privilege to be able to work on it. And I'm just going to show you two images. And why I went to that image 
I just showed you. Uh, this is made, uh, well, it's got a strange title, Kinkakawaui, and it's a, uh, it's about a TV program. Um, and it's one of these game shows where you, very poor people participate and they get given big cash prizes. And this is a uh, one such program where this poor old lady's been pulled up to, to, to contest and she's given this cash money and she staggers on and everyone's happy except, look, they're not. They realize it's a sham. This poverty is exploitation, um, that the mass media is providing, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of providing bread and circuses for the masses, if you like. I mean, this is referring to Marcus's Philippines, the Marcos period, that, uh, that people are not given any, any real means of expression, they're just given uh, uh, surrogates. And there's one of a series of pictures of this kind that he made, which I was very impressed by. And then um, this image, which is a vast painting, well, six meters wide, that's pretty big. And it's called Kane of Kabunian, numbered but can't be counted. Now, it's based on a uh, myth. Many different groups of indigenous people live in the Philippines, and this is, happens to be a Bontoc myth. Uh, Tapaya, he's one of a family of six, came from a very poor family. Um, he's studied very much, not only art, but also um, folk myth and the mythology of, um, of, uh, of the Philippines. And it's uh, this giant dog who in Bontoc myth saved humans from the great flood aided by Kabunian, I think we can see Kabunian there, who formed mountains out of a piece of cloth that warmed humanity. Um, so that's essentially the, the image one's got there. Uh, but this isn't a, just a picturesque piece of folklorism. It's actually about what's been happening in the Philippines and the environmental despoliation of the land, of the forest, of the jungle, which is causing these terrible floods. So in a symbolical way, he's bringing together these old stories to actually show uh, an image of, 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 of social conflict, of economic conflict in the present, but actually suggesting that, that within the people themselves, they don't have to have this done to them. It's always being done, done to them by someone else, that there are these ways in which they can, uh, they can heal themselves. And um, the, uh, this uh, sort of creation myths, he's very, very much fascinated by. Also certainly <clears throat> strongly influenced by, by Mexican mural painting of the early part of the, um, of the 20th century. And there's this very strong link because of the, the Spanish colonialism, they were both colonized by the Spanish before the Americans got in. Um, and, um, and uh, this appreciation for Mexican modernism is something that is, uh, has been informing uh, aspects of Philippine art for quite a long time. Also, <clears throat> um, looking at theatrical tradition and the Commedia dell'arte, well, one of the precursors, uh, I mean, as, as uh, Chinese noodles are a precursor of Italian spaghetti, you could say that, uh, that the Wayang, the shadow puppet plays of Indonesia and Southeast Asia, are precursors of Commedia dell'arte in some ways. And uh, this is a, a, a Wayang that uh, Harry Dono organized in 1988 when he was still living in Yogyakarta. Uh, uh, and it's a, a covered, semi-traditional satire on social and political life. And uh, he's continued to do that throughout his life and somewhere, sometimes got in, in trouble for that. If you, uh, if you read the chapter of the book um, about Harry's work, uh, I can describe to, you, <laughs> describe to you the trouble we both got into um, with the Indonesian government from, from something that he made in Oxford. Um, 
This is one of the paintings that are uh, called Eating Bullets, very much from this militarized, brutal culture of the Sukhato Su Su regime. And this, this installation that he made in Oxford called Blooming in Arms, um, which is really about the way how the military had been laying mines in the jungle and how people had, who lived there actually were being, being damaged all the time, were being, being killed or losing limbs as a result of this, and how this was part of government policy. The, um, the Indonesian embassy, when, when this exhibition was made in 1996, were, were far from uh, delighted uh, by, uh, by it, I have to say. Also, uh, looking at this kind of politically engaged work, one sees the, the, the traditions as we're looking at uh, uh, a link between German, um, German Dada and, uh, and Japan in the 1920s. Here there's an there's a interesting link between Mongolia and, and the German um, satirical tradition uh, in contemporary world. The Taste of Money in Between Clouds by Bazanjaf Cholijavin. Uh, it's a, it's a good-sized work. Um, it's uh, one and a half meters wide. It's extremely intricately painted, and the style it's painted is called Zurak style. And this is the name they give to that uh, used for religious painting. Um, it's, a, it's a Buddhist country, uh, Mongolia, and uh, they, they got their Buddhism from Tibet. And so it's, it's a kind of Tibeto-Mongolian style of traditional painting. And he makes these contemporary paintings in this style. Here are some close-ups. So there's Buddhist devils, and you can see the, well, the floating world being somewhat attacked there. Uh, but it's very much an image of, uh, of Mongolia, even now, uh, particularly um, uh, 10 years ago when this was made, um, being overtaken by foreign influences and also by, by profiteers inside the country. The, the, the misuse of natural resources, which is widespread, uh, unplanned mining, which is devastating the landscape. It's a terribly sad story, but rather strong painting. There's your chubby businessman with his other faces. Also in Mongolia, uh, Uruntuya Dagsambu, um, woman artist, uh, people bring me silence, very, very strong uh, painter. And uh, she's certainly been very strongly uh, impacted by, by Japanese art. Um, and particularly woodblock prints, which she studied very intensively. And this somehow bleeds into the large paintings he makes, makes today. Or um, video artist Almagul Menli Bayeva, uh, Trang Soxiana Dreams. Uh, this is a video from 2011, and it's really centered on the desertification of the Aral Sea. It's an Aral Sea which hardly exists any longer. And this is all because of agricultural policies on the Russian and uh, Uzbekistan side. She, in fact, is Kazakh. And so she frames this within a kind of mythological history. And this woman, rather good-looking woman, wearing military dress, uh, but draped with a desert fox, is a symbol of a, what they call a peri. A peri is a, is a spirit, an earth spirit. And it's a kind of earth spirit that goes across Central Asia into, into Persia, even the word is Persian in our origin. So these spirits sit around in this devastated landscape. There's the hulk of a boat that used to float on the Aral Sea. Now it's completely rusted and on dry land. The waters are removed from beneath it. So there's a kind of elegy of these dead animals also, because they too can live. And that's a it's cutting between documentary footage that she took and then stage footage, which she, she made there. This is documentary footage in that she's, she's with the settlements living on the edge of what used to be the edge of the Aral Sea. And these are the kids and the camels and the, the, they're playing with these uh, pelts of desert foxes there. So they become like little animals, little spirits themselves. So that is charming and they're, they're, they're very... Uh, they're very 
they grip you. But it's also incredibly sad because then you watch the men getting in the truck and they have to drive an hour and a half before they can get to the edge of the sea. And then the sea is full of dead fish. They're fishermen. And it's uh, incredible. And then strong women. Well, and spirits. Bauti Kher, um, uh, Indian artist. She was born in Great Britain and decided to move to India uh, to work. And she's largely made her career uh, in India. And uh, she makes these hybrid works. Um, and this is a, called The Hunter and the Prophet. So it's a kind of image of, uh, a satirical image of Durga, the, one of the goddesses of death in, uh, in Hinduism, who often stamps on the figure of, a, of an unbeliever, usually a male. Here it's some kind of animal um, taken from the butcher's shop. She has a feather duster and this animal's head. There's kind of ironical quality about her work, um, about the Hindu revival, perhaps, the way how fund Hindu fundamentalism has become such a reactionary force in India and elsewhere. And then this work, uh, which is a, a kind of portrait of all women, um, uh, called The Lady with an Ermine. It's quoting, of course, the famous painting uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, of a very beautiful woman carrying a small ermine. Here, the ermine is, is sort of suspended in a slightly suggestive way in front of her. And she's looking through a pitchfork uh, uh, as if it's the kind of the bar, bars of a, of a prison, of a cage. And this woman, this black woman, uh, looking ahead of her, that you see that the top of her head has been sliced off and there's this huge granite top on her head. And on top of that is balanced these, uh, these cups, these cups and saucers. So it's a sort of terrible balancing act. And I think uh, it's, a, it's quite a, a good uh, place to uh, uh, leave this uh, talk a view of women and the position of women today in many parts of the world where things are not so rosy, where it's difficult, the weight of responsibility, of labor, of survival is weighing on them and still they have to balance somehow to survive. And uh, she also makes many other kinds of works. I just quoted these two, but I, I hope you feel I've only quoted, shown you very strong works by an artist. They can hardly be representative. It's been uh, an eclectic trip through many aspects of, uh, of contemporary art uh, in Asia. And perhaps uh, just to suggest uh, that the artist, uh, as Bruce Nauman, the artist reveals unbelievable truths. Um, this work by uh, Saigo Chan, made fairly soon after he'd moved from Japan, moved start from China, of course, and worked for 10 years or so in Japan, then he moves to New York. And uh, he made these series of works, he uses gunpowder, called The Century with Mushroom Clouds, well, quoting, of course, the, the atom bomb. Project for the 20th century, looking towards Manhattan. So he, he took, made this work in several places uh, across the U.S., including the Alamo test site where the first atom bomb was tested. But somehow he ended up on uh, looking at the tip of Manhattan at the Twin Towers. And he made these works very simply with a, uh, with a cardboard tube and just a small charge of gunpowder. And then it was set fire. Then poof, you get your mushroom cloud and photograph from the artist. And uh, you have the Twin Towers there. Strange. <laughs> he certainly has no foresight or anything like that. It just shows how art does somehow fix on things, that it, uh, it deals with important things in time and place and, uh, and power. And uh, maybe often in ways that we don't immediately realize. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. It's, um, 
Yeah, it's it's really interesting uh, history of trousers, and then also comparative <laughs> cultural history, and then also it also well. it's it's the whole storytelling of uh, the human beings around the human beings, and also it really reveals that how everything or individual artists and their works uh, intermingle with the society and culture of their time. Mm. Yeah. I'm I'm just wondering that, uh, as you said, when you were studying uh, art history in the 70s, it was about uh, comparison and equality of uh, Western male artists. But when you brought these non-Western, the art from non-Western region, then uh, obviously you need to explain or sort of make a story of uh, the politics and economy and the society behind the works. And how did you come to that way of interpreting art? And then also how did people in the West reacted at the time? Mm. Well, I mean, the first exhibition I ever made was called Germany and Ferment, um, Art and Society in Germany from 1900 to 1935. And I made that while I was still an undergraduate um, at Durham University, but it also traveled to museums in Leicester and Sheffield. Now, I won't even go into all of that, but, but it seemed to me to be, at that time I was a history um, undergraduate. Uh, and it seemed to me that there was a very strong link between what the general tenor of art and the sort of topics that were coming up and the way how people express themselves and a much bigger story. And if you look back in the history of this, it's always true. In the Renaissance, it's very true. This has to do with patrons. It has to do with uh, patronage, what is possible for people to do. Uh, and of course, after the end of the uh, 18th century, the whole idea of uh, rationalism, the enlightenment, the idea of artist, art, artistic autonomy, um, it becomes even an even more intense um, project. And if we believe there is an artistic autonomy, and I, I do, I think it's an absolutely fundamental thing about mod both modern and contemporary art. Um, I'm very interested on, in how, how, it is, um, how it is exercised, because by it we mean freedom freedom to do what you want, maybe whatever you want. But, but there, there, there obviously have to be some limits. There's also the idea of the avant-garde, um, which has somewhat uh, disappeared from view now, but it's something that I grew up with, that, that artists um, were on a, some kind of cutting edge, and that if they were on this cutting edge, maybe they were seeing things ahead or more clearly than, uh, than one does. I don't think there's, a, there's an avant-garde now, but I think artists, if they're any good, they are on a cutting edge and they can see things very clearly. Um, but I'm I started talking about Germany because there was one book in particular um, written by a writer, a German writer called Siegfried Krakow, and it was called From Caligari to Hitler, A Psychological History of the German Film. It appeared in 1948, I think, or 1949. But I found this incredibly helpful in that he actually looked at the thematics of cinema from 1918 to 1933 in, uh, in, in, in Germany. And what happened to different directors, of course, some had to leave and others came up and so forth. And it really showed a much bigger uh, social and political story about what was happening there. You know, the whole thing seemed inevitable when you, when, when you read his book. And, and in a sense, looking at, looking at the kind of psychological history, um, it's, a, it's a very, not an absolutely focused term, but I think you probably know what I mean. Mm. It, it does give an insight into what's going on and mm. the fact that artists are influenced by their peer groups, by their times. I mean, the young British artists, um, all supposed to, you know, the reason they were so sort of, in people's faces was that they grew up under the Thatcher years and this was a rebellion against it. Um, well, yes and no. 
uh, because if you look at it, the people who were supporting the young British artists in Britain were the very people who put Thatcher into power. So the money to create them came from Thatcher. Um, so I didn't quite swallow that one. Um, but I think one does have to look at these relationships and, and uh, begin to test them. And I think, uh, say, say someone like uh, Rodel Tapia, um, I think some, some of his work has been bought by big corporations, um, which, is, which is interesting. Hmm. But, but the, the, certainly the thinking behind his works and the inaction of them and the public nature of them, because a lot of them are in museums too, um, are, I think, helpful to a consideration not only about the position of, of Philippines today, but actually about, about shared myths that we all have and, and actually what's happening generally in environment. It's hmm. very important. Hmm. Um, I think um, uh, you have over, you have an overview of larger Asia, not only East, South, or Southeast Asia, but also Central Asia, which is often sort of not properly seen. And mm. uh, but how do you um, see what we call it Asia? And uh, but it's, it's uh, the question is probably too big. But um, the, well, what is, you have, what you have seen, is mm. not simply the someone who has seen. Beijing, Tokyo, and uh, Jakarta. It's much larger and diverse. So I'm just mm. uh, curious about how you would describe Asia after all. Yeah, this is this is a question that Yasuko Furuichi spent, uh, <laughs> I think, 20 years trying to answer in the uh, Land Society Asia Center. And I think she had a very good crack at it because uh, with all the different things she did, it, it's trying to define the indefinable. It's mm. it's a use of useful term like um, America's never very useful, but the Mer the Americas is, um, and that goes from the tip of Chile right up to the uh, top of um, top of Canada, um, and Asia is the same sort of thing. I mean, it's so diverse. Um, but it does, and, and then you've got, you've got Central Asia means something, Eastern Asia means Southern Asia, yeah, Southeast Asia, I mean, these are, these are kind of groupings that you have. Mm -hmm. And then Western Asia sort of falls apart a bit, I mean, uh, Turkey's part of Asia, um, but it doesn't feel itself to be so much. Um, is, is Persia? Um, maybe. Afghanistan certainly is. Um, yeah, it, it, these are these are working words that are, that can, you know, and sometimes you have to define what you mean by it. But yeah. uh, um, as a as a as a as a group, uh, there's there's their their shared religions. Um, their linguistic systems, all this kind of thing. So it, it, it's, uh, it's getting towards something that's useful, but if one's going to be, start being Pacific, one has to look at particular links. And I think that's why it's so important to look at links between, between bits of Asia and places which aren't Asia, and how these things move in and out of them. Um, and always have done, always have done. Um, it's, uh, that's how culture is, it's extremely fluid. And you can say with the media that we have today, it's even more fluid and quicker. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think that, that we underestimate the past for how, for how, how much it knew, I mean, how much people knew at that time, and also um, their capacities. Mm -hmm. Instance of the, these, uh, these uh, people found in the Taklamakan Desert, very little known, known about their, their culture other than their bodies. Um, but they, they, they're relating very much to, to European culture, mm. and mm. certainly in the, in genetically uh, as well. Mm. Yeah, when I, with my little experience in Central Asia, that, that their facial features are more Asian, but uh, their like language culture 
and also um, political path is more closer to Russia. So uh, that, uh, that in, in betweenness was extremely mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, mm -hmm. that was already more than 10 years after uh, Soviet Union disappeared. But um, that the culture remains and then also languages mm -hmm. remain. So that sort of uh, entanglement was extremely interesting. Yeah. But, but I, I think I wanted to also ask you about um, your subtitle, uh, Tradition and Modernity. And these two, comparison or dichotomy, is often used uh, to talk about the non-Western uh, culture and art from the non-Western region. And uh, how would you suggest that curators and artists to be to be able to avoid this simplistic structure of two poles, uh, right or left, or West mm. or non-West, or modernity or tradition? Mm. Well, I suppose if you, if you use tradition and modernity in a, in a British sense, I mean, the tradition is that of academic art history, uh, and then mm -hmm. modernity is the sort of modernism that comes in. Um, in Asia, you have such a rich, very, such rich number of indigenous cultures who are still making things um, um, which are completely contemporary, um, but uh, don't fit in with any, any modern uh, context. And really, I'm trying to explode these the, these terms. I mean, modern modernity is a kind of um, it's an imposition, and it's also a term which is very judgmental. Uh, like you have to be modern. Uh, if you're not modern, you're nothing. Um, you could be traditional, of course, um, but no. You, if, if you if you're not making something that looks as though it was made you know, 300 years ago, uh, and you're not modern, then you just don't exist. And this is ridiculous. Uh, it's this uh, dichotomy within modernity which I found very difficult, um, and it's the idea of constant progression. You know, I referred earlier to the to the idea of avant-garde. You know, the idea of one avant-garde would succeed, another one succeed, another one, till it eventually imploded. Of course, it did, um, and um, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it's really a, a, a dead end, um, and. To be modern is saying you have to be a particular way and you have to conform to certain uh, 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 certain values and these were all western values hmm. they weren't shared they weren't created elsewhere they were western mother modernity was colonializing and i say large numbers of people in asia had modernity inflicted on them unwillingly um so i i, I hope that uh, in the book i, I made these uh, these ambivalences are very, very clear. Mm. Um, and this is really why I like the term uh, con con contemporary, uh, which I think one can use now, um, in, that it's, in that it's open, it's equal, it's, uh, it's uh, even, and it's, it's, it's a field in which everyone can play because all, to be contemporary, all you have to do is make something now. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You know, we know from modernity that you know a, a, a can full of shit can be an artwork. So, um, so just make something now. And then the question is, is this any good? Hmm. And it's the question for all art. Hmm. Is it any good? And in what terms, if so, in what terms? Hmm. And that's, that's where I come in. This is my work, I guess. The artists yeah. themselves will <laughs> think about it. Very much so. I'm sure they do lie awake, awake at night thinking about it. But this question of, of, of quality, and always with, with students, I'd say, go and see an exhibition and then tell me, was it any good? Mm. It sounds such a simple thing to say. And then, well, what do you think? And then, it, it, you know, then a real conversation. Of course, many different levels of goodness, and it mm. goes into ethical, moral, um, communal, uh, individual, all these things. Um, and something, you know, the, the elements of badness which create a good impression, if you see what I mean. 
um, not goody goody, not moralizing. I don't mm. think the art should moralize at all. Um, it should be honest, and that honesty is what I'm looking for um, to actually give an insight into how someone feels. And that has to be the artist, it can be the other person, it is how someone feels and thinks about life. I mean, say, uh, 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 Ida's uh, giant member Fuji is a very good example of that. It's, you know, it's a tough image, but still, I think it's a very important work. Thank you. I think it's, um, it's a good words to um, ending this talk. And um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you again for sharing your very long experience. I think you're one of the very few Western male curators who had this um, this much of a diverse experience in um, over the region, and also particularly for Japan that you started in. 85 or maybe before the 85 show so it means like early 80s and uh, through your experience in in japan and bye bye kitty and uh, so uh, it's it's really interesting to have your perspective how you have seen um, contemporary art of this culture and then also this region so uh, let i would like to ask everyone to thank him online <laughs> and uh, thank you for your morning and I also would like to thank uh, our, our interpreter, simultaneous interpreter, uh, Takako Enso and then Akemi Nomoto. Thank you very, very much for your wonderful work. David, can you stay online? <laughs> Yes, and, sure. Yeah, and then we will close the session, uh, Argent Talk number 40 by David Ullut. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.